the master of ceremony, and his name is Henry Boxu. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I call me Henry Bonsu in Manchester and in Brixton, born in Manchester, residing currently in Brixton for me. But when I go to Lagos, uh, to the Yoruba area, they call me Nana Bonsu. <laughs> and if I go to the Ashanti region, where my spirit was forged, Henry Nana Kwame Ose Bonsu. You have to say the name pregnantly because it means something. Bonsu. He said Bonsu. Bonsu. Thank you very much. I'm very privileged in my job to travel all over hosting events, sometimes for the UN, for the World Health Assembly, but I'm always, always keen to come back to Africa together because of uh, the energy with which the, the student and graduate group um, put these events on and how dogged and determined they are in uh, reaching out to really stellar speakers, performers, and people who really have Africa at their heart, and today is no exception. So think back to the history of this event. In 2015, we tried to reimagine Africa. In 2016, we tried to engineer an inclusive Africa. Then uh, last year, we looked at Africa and the world in transition. All this disruption that we're seeing, the end of the multilateral system towards a binary, bilateral system. We have some Canadians in the house, and they're feeling the brunt of the Trump tongue lashing at the moment. We'll hear from one of them uh, very shortly. And this year we're looking at pathways to a new Africa. Practically, how do we do that? How do we achieve that? It's about action, not just the theory. And if you look at the running order, you'll see just how involved it is and how it tries to uh, double down on this agenda. So we've got six panels. Parallel sessions both here and in the Keynes Library. We hope that you will try your best to attend them. Um, leave no panellists behind, as it were. So, for example, at the panel one, peace and conflict resolution. How do we deal with our differences? Ignore or face them. Parallel panel two, African development lessons from emerging economies. And in betwixt and between, we've got some really powerful keynote speakers some have travelled in, especially from Addis Ababa, despite Eid and all the commitments that bestows upon somebody to be here today. Thank you very much for your determination to be here. One of the things we always try and do at these events is to make sure it's not a dialogue of the deaf. We want call and response. So quality, crisp and relevant questions and interventions, please. No speeches from the floor, but real testing questions. We want that, and all the speakers, I think, are prepared for that. So without uh, further ado, let's get, um, well, you've had the Ashanti welcome. Now we want the Cambridge welcome. And I think it's the first time, correct me if I'm wrong, team, organizing committee, the first time we've actually had the vice chancellor here to give the welcome address in person. Is that right? The first time? Hmm? Call? Response? I think it is. <laughs> Let me say a word or two about this person. Professor Stephen J. Toot, O-C-L-L-D, the new Vice-Chancellor, newish I think, appointed on 1st of October 2017, the first non-Brit to be Vice-Chancellor of Cambridge University in its 800 years of history. So we must give him a very, very warm welcome. He is an international jurist, if I can put it that way, an academic. He's held very high positions at really august seats of learning uh, all over the world. And he has done some monitoring of elections, not least in South Africa, the first non-racial election in South Africa yes. in 1994. And he's going to make you really and warmly welcome to this august seat of learning. Please. Be very, very warm and chaleureux. In your, and onto the francophone speakers here, chaleureux. In your bienvenue to Professor Stephen J. Tu, Vice Chancellor of the University of Cambridge. Well, thank you very much uh, for that very warm welcome. And uh, I want to say a special thank you to Lakshana and Femi for the invitation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I was really delighted to be asked to join you here today because of past work, Africa is indeed close to my heart and it's especially pleasing 
to be at a student-driven event. So my thanks and congratulations to the Africa Society of Cambridge University on mounting what promises to be an excellent day. And I'm really sorry that I can't remain longer uh, to experience that, but I'm going to make sure that I get reports of the conversation. I'm pleased to welcome many of you to Cambridge, both the city and the university, the two being, of course, inextricably linked together. Being together, working together, Africa together, are, of course, what we are here to celebrate. How wonderful that we have representatives of an entire continent, home to 54 nations, more than 1.2 billion people, coming together to work toward common goals, to exchange ideas, carve out pathways to a new Africa. Imagine trying to hold a Europe Together conference. <laughs> One thing is for sure, it's not going to be held in Britain anytime soon. <laughs> the great South African, the great African Archbishop Desmond Tutu has often talked of the concept of Ubuntu, a term that means humanity. Sometimes Ubuntu is translated as I am because we are. It's a profound thought. And it's true. We're nothing without each other. The University of Cambridge is nothing without the city of Cambridge. The University of Cambridge is nothing without its colleges. The University of Cambridge is nothing without her people. Students, staff, academics from the entire world with the most diverse talents and expertise. We all learn from each other and develop through listening and exchanging ideas. Archbishop Tutu said, and I quote, Ubuntu speaks of the very essence of being human. It is to say, my humanity is caught up, is inextricably bound up in yours. We belong to a bundle of life. A person is a person through other persons, end quote. Sadly, African history is scarred by the actions of those who have failed to recognize each other's humanity. There are versions of the same scars that crisscross the entire world. There are, of course, many challenges facing Africa today, though they are far from exclusive to Africa. War, disease, climate change, food security, burgeoning populations, dwindling resources, the displacement of millions of people as a result of all of these elements. There are challenges that we must work together to resolve for the sake of the planet and for future generations. They are challenges that this collegiate university is working to tackle alongside NGOs, industry, and universities nationally and internationally. I've mentioned that Cambridge has a diverse population of students and staff from all over the globe, but I'm under no alert illusions about our past, nor about some challenging aspects of our present. We are part of the world and not apart from it. There are biases here, including racial biases, unconscious or otherwise, and we must tackle them head on. Part of what will happen by acknowledging that our institution's future is bound up with Africa's. So we are trying to develop new ways to work with and for Africa. We're strengthening partnerships with African universities and African industries because it's by working together that we can achieve a better future. Cambridge already has research partnerships with 50 institutions across 18 countries in Africa, and we're looking to expand this wherever possible. Our Cambridge Africa program is designed to develop mutually beneficial engagement between researchers in Africa and Cambridge to assist African universities to become world-leading research institutions and for us to learn from their expertise. It's a program that's thrived for more than 10 years because it relies on real partnership. Because it addresses and helps to reverse the continent's brain drain, encouraging graduates to go back to Africa to contribute to its flourishing. 
and because it aims to address African priorities in Africa and to take the lead from African researchers. I've visited Africa many times, and although my visits have been largely work-related, it's a place I associate with great vibrancy and creativity. In my former life as an international lawyer, I traveled to Kenya, Uganda, Zimbabwe, and South Africa to work with communities on economic development, human rights, and legal and judicial reform. As was mentioned, I was fortunate indeed, it is one of the most important formative experiences of my life that I was a UN observer at the pivotal, pivotal excuse me, South African elections of 1994. As you will remember, after years of apartheid, millions of people queued across four days to exercise their newly acquired citizenship rights. I personally witnessed long lines of farm workers in the Orange Free State, some carrying grandmothers and grandfathers piggyback to vote for the first time in their lives. I remember the excitement on the streets erupting into euphoria as Nelson Mandela became the nation's first black president. I'm reminded of that moment every time I walk into my office and find myself face to face with Mandiba smiling back at me in the framed campaign poster from that election that hangs outside my office. It was a time of great joy, of positivity, of optimism. It was a time when we could see the road to a new Africa shimmering ahead. Many of you were not born then, or were perhaps very young. Over the years, some of that optimism has evaporated. But the road, I'm convinced, is still there. Africa is a continent of real and powerful possibilities. She may be the cradle of humanity, and in that sense, to us, the oldest continent. Yet at the same time, she is the youngest, with a youthful population whose minds are open and imaginative. With education and support and a spirit of togetherness, the opportunities are, I believe, endless. And young people are seizing those opportunities. They're taking small steps and indeed great strides that can and do make a difference. Take, for example, the students of Makarere University in Kampala who are working in tandem with the government on a joint program that has established Kira Motors, a company that has built and will manufacture solar-powered buses. What a great initiative. Buses powered by the sun, and there's a lot of sunshine in Uganda. It's created local em employment, local manufacturing, and the long-term vision is to make all the parts in Uganda itself. Africa could and should become a leader in sustainability, as must Cambridge. With the threat of climate change and the need for power in order to develop, the use of renewable energy is an imperative. Another young company I've come across is a social enterprise that employs 70 people in Nairobi. They collect flip-flops, 520,000 of them in 2017 alone, clean and mold the rubber, sculpting them into works of art, toys, and useful objects. The discarded footwear is collected from beaches or found floating in the sea. In an age of waste, making art out of pollution, out of plastic, is a way to raise awareness, to provide employment, and to contribute towards education. Ecotourism and the environment are priorities for the University of Botswana, where young people are increasingly aware of the necessity to cherish their surroundings, and in giving travelers access to them to encourage better understanding. Well-conceived ecotourism can be a great thing for local communities, and ensures a sustainable future for their children. In South Africa, a young entrepreneur, Ludwig Marishani, then a student at the University of Cape Town, came up with the idea for a simple and cheap germ-killing lotion that for the 2.5 billion people worldwide who do not have access to clean water or for whom water is precious and expensive can be a lifesaver. Changes in technology enabled him to act. The rural province where he lived had limited resources, but he could access the internet to undertake research 
simply with his mobile phone. His company, which makes improved hygiene and the avoidance of disease possible for millions, is now going from strength to strength. There are many, many such inspirational young Africans. Just this week, Nigerian Chimananda Ngozi Andichi was announced as the winner of this year's Penn Pinter Prize, awarded to a writer anywhere in the world of outstanding literary merit who shows a fierce intellectual determination to define the real truth of our lives and our societies. Adichie's powerful writing, and indeed her influential TED Talks, address prejudice, particularly as concerns gender and race. As her most recent book, Dear Ijeawale, begins, and I quote, your premise, the solid unbending belief that you start off with, what is your premise? Your feminist premise should be, I matter. I matter equally. Not if only, not as long as. I matter equally. Full stop. End quote. A premise that extends beyond feminism to counter all prejudice. I matter equally. You matter equally. Africans matter equally. There are many obstacles on the pathway to a new Africa. But the creativity and the determination of her young people, people like Ludwig, Chimananda, and others, all of you at the conference here today, inspires us. Through them, through you, through your aspirations and ideas, education, dedication, and hard work, African nations take control of their own destiny. Through them, peace, prosperity, and a sustainable future will be achieved. In closing, I want to congratulate the co-chairs again, Lakshana and Femi, all involved in the Africa Society of Cambridge University. We are deeply proud of the work you do. You represent not just Africa's future, but it's today. You are already leaders. In the present, you have brought together great minds, fascinating speakers, for what I am sure will be a stimulating and inspirational program. I'm sure it's a program that will provoke passionate debate, but I'm sure as well that you will approach it in the spirit of Ubuntu. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed uh, for that superb welcoming address and in the spirit of Ubuntu and African creativity at 8 o'clock this evening by which time we'll have finished uh, this gathering we'll be looking towards uh, Russia to see the super eagles of Nigeria hopefully defeating the Croatians. <laughs> yes, we want to see that, do you not? Know? There are five African teams in this World Cup, we want them all to go as far as they can. Right, you're going to hear from a range of Africans today from all over the continent, and uh, the organizers have done really, really well in reflecting uh, the diversity of talent at a very, very high level. Our first keynote speaker comes from the Republic of Egypt. From Africa. She's a, huh? I come from Africa. From Africa, aha, okay. One of the ones reflected up here, thankfully. Not all of them. <laughs> which, which, which is superb. Uh, here's a little, as an aside and by way of introduction. A few years ago, I did a documentary for BBC World Service called Rebranding Nigeria. And the Nigerian government was very keen to participate and they were keen to get the message out that Nigeria is the heart of Africa. Good people, great nation. But when I spoke to people in Lagos and Abuja and elsewhere, they said, we don't want all this government uh, propaganda. If you want to rebrand Nigeria, fix the roads. If you want to rebrand Nigeria, give me power. That's what I was told. And this is highly relevant because in many African countries, 
we have a real deficit of infrastructure, of energy, of ICT, and it impacts on every element and area of life. Our first speaker is tasked with changing all of that, and she has set about her task with great energy and determination, to the point where she will rather take two or three days to go from Addis Ababa to, say, Accra, instead of maybe half a day by flying outside and transiting through Istanbul or Dubai. She is indefatigable, she is energetic, she is focused and determined. She is the African Union Commissioner for Infrastructure, Energy, ICT and Tourism. Please welcome Her Excellency Dr. Amani Abu Zain. Recognize myself after but this. But it's you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. And happy Eid. Let's remember that yesterday and today is still Eid. Yes. So, um, <laughs> so the choice of day couldn't have been better. So, since we are all celebrating, um, now, we, today we're celebrating Africa, and it's really a pleasure and honor to be among you today. Um, I know that the Vice Chancellor has just left, but I would like also to acknowledge his presence. I think he, he, uh, his speech were really, really insightful and also very, very true in everything he, he said. Unfortunately, after my uh, uh, just a couple of hours I would have to leave, but I would also like to uh, acknowledge uh, His Excellency Honorable Minister, Hazlai Mohammed, who will be, you will be seeing later this afternoon. Uh, I was in Nigeria only a couple of weeks ago, and uh, Nigeria hosted the United Nations World Tourism Organization, and they invited me to uh, also as the Commissioner for Tourism. I must say, Nigeria put on a great show for all of us, <laughs> especially on the culture side and art side, uh, it was fantastic. It was absolutely fantastic. We spent a couple, a couple of days, fantastic, uh, 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 great artists, young people, very dynamic, I loved it. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge uh, uh, Professor uh, Ndulu and Professor Nkube. Uh, he and I, we were at the African Development Bank together, so I had the privilege of also serving at the African Development Bank when uh, he was the, um, uh, the chief economist, so uh, such a pleasure to be here. This is also the opportunity and the time to uh, thank very much uh, uh, Femi and Lakshan. They did a wonderful job, I must say, uh, inviting us, all of us, I mean, to see all these people, I mean, to travel all the way to come here and knowing how busy or otherwise engaged people are, but still determined to be here. I must say, yes, of course, each one of us wanted to be here, but also, Femi and Lachana made sure we are here. Yes. So, thank you very, very much uh, for this uh, great one. I uh, also must also acknowledge your presence, each one of you. Uh, it's a Saturday, and you make time to be here. Uh, that if it shows anything, it shows also your commitment personally, but also your commitment to the continent. And I really salute that and I would like to acknowledge you. So, distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, very young brothers, very young sisters, I must say, I'm delighted and honored to have this opportunity to speak with you today. I would like to thank the co chairs for the kind invitation. And I must start by saying, I have some good news, I have some less good news. So which one would I start with? Less good. No, I'll start with the good news. <laughs> the good news is that our continent is young, is dynamic, and is growing fast. Africa already plays an active and positive role in global affairs. There are many opportunities in African countries. Our economic growth seems to be recovering. There are opportunities related to demographic dividend, a growing middle class, urbanization. Many African countries are leading the way in the use of new technologies. 
We see a drive for innovation and creativity as entrepreneurs seek new ways to solve day-to-day -day challenges such as banking, access to energy, waste management, transport, and logistics. And, well, however, some challenges remain. Population growth is outpacing economic and social development. Africa's population is set to double by 2050. African economies are not growing fast enough and are not creating enough jobs, nor the right types of jobs. Thus, employment continues to be one of Africa's greatest challenges. Another challenge is the need for <clears throat> improved governance and predictable framework conditions, especially for investors. We need the, real, the rule of law for ourselves and for our partners to guarantee the investment. Our needs for adequate and affordable infrastructure remain enormous. More than 600 million Africans are without electricity. We need $130 billion annually to bridge the infrastructure gap. These are huge. Dear participants, the need to work together as Africans has always been pressing. And we now have more reason than ever to reinforce our solidarity. The solutions for our biggest challenges are right here with you, the young people and talented Africans. You have everything it takes to make our continent what it should be. You represent a wealth of ideas and perspectives and you have a critical role to play in building a better continent. Allow me to suggest three pillars on which we can together focus. First, special efforts must be directed to deepen our cohesion and consensus. Africa's diversity should be seen as a source of vitality and dynamism. It is up to each one of us to contribute to this African character, one that is confident, at peace with oneself, and open to partnership with the wider world. That's why I said I'm African. Yes, yes. Second, we must accelerate African integration, both economic and political. The unity and integration agenda is a collective ambition. Its realization re requires, therefore, the involvement of all Africans. One way to also make them work for us, make it work for us, is to stay united and collaborate closely on the things that have the most impact on the lives of our people. Regional infrastructure and trade are primary examples, which is why we launched this year the single air market for transportation to liberalize the skies of Africa, and uh, we also launched the implementation of the continental free trade. These are very important. Solidarity gives us the means to tackle challenges more effectively rather than individual countries with less leverage. The third pillar, which really builds on the first two, is that we must do the right things to seize the opportunities presented by globalization. This means investing in the capacities of our people, especially our youth, through education and information technology, so that Africans compete effectively in the knowledge industries that drive prosperity Acquiring a mindset for success and ownership is the most important condition for transforming our continent. This year, as I mentioned, we witnessed the launch of the single African air transport market, as well as the signing of the African Continental Free Trade Area and the Protocol on Free Movement of Persons and the African Passport. In the area of peace, security and governance, the African Union has demonstrated undeniable proactiveness. In different parts of the continent, African uni uniformed personnel are deployed to combat terrorism, restore security, and help create basic conditions for sustainable peace and reconciliation. Equally, sustained efforts are deployed in the areas of prevention and mediation. Democracy and human rights are progressively taking root on the continent despite the bags and difficulties. We should take pride in these achievements. But let us also remain vigilant and conscious 
that much still needs to be done to overcome the obstacles that could derail this hard-won <coughs> progress. We must maintain a sense of urgency. All the stars are aligned for Africa, and so we cannot allow time to work against us. Our people have already been waiting for too long. Here, the university, you are already on a path to leadership and use for service in your respective communities. I call on you to use your talents to create opportunity and well-being for others. We count on the young people of Africa to build a dignified and prosperous future for everyone in our, on our continent. We should all work together to change the narrative from Africa can to Africans do. And I thank you all for your kind attention. I thought you might do this, you come in on time and indeed on the budget, which gives us a little bit of a time for people to ask you a number of questions. Sure. And you have come in directly from Ethiopia. And she did not fly BA. No, no, no. She did not fly Emirates. She did not fly Turkish Airlines. <laughs> Excellency, which airline oh, did you travel? Oh, Airlines, of course. Which airline did you travel? Ethiopian Airlines. Ethiopian Airlines. The wings are up. Let's hear it for the commissioner, please. A lot of Africans say, oh, I travel BA. Oh, Emirates. It has to be Emirates. Dubai. You like Dubai? No. The commissioner went with Ethiopia direct flight, yes? It's a direct flight. Eight yes. hours. But it's not always the case, unfortunately. I was just mentioning earlier that we still have a problem of traveling, say, from east to west of uh, uh, Africa. Mm -hmm. I was in Kigali, and to go to Nwatshop, it took me like two days. I refused to transit outside the continent. And by principle, I'm trying not to transit outside the continent. And I wanted for myself to feel how bad it is, you know, to travel from one side to another, but also for others to feel ashamed that this is still the case on the continent. Knowing that 80% of our air traffic on the continent is non-African. So we're changing that. So this year we launched the single African air transport market. 26 countries have joined in and this is changing now. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, so let's see if we can get, let's see if we can pair with the Commissioner with a couple of questions. Yes, okay. Tell us who you are very briefly and then ask your question. Make it count. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to be here from over here to Cambridge. Uh, I worked for a while uh, in a mini career company in Tanzania. Uh, Thank you, I'm sorry? I worked uh, for a while in a mini grid uh, company, a mini grid operator in Tanzania. Uh, so many grids are a system of village scale that provide power with uh, a number of solar panels and all that sort of diesel generator. I wanted to know what uh, the what uh, what uh, is there a policy at a continent wide level uh, developing uh, this kind of systems and uh, what kind of systems? Mini grids. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So yeah, I make it more clear. Uh, that's uh, that's all my question. Shall I take two Yeah, questions? let's take two yes, Another yes. second question. Okay, over there. I always develop my calf muscles when I come to this event. A lot of upstairs going up and down. Okay, your question. Thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, I would like you to just explain what, um, uh, in the speech of the Vice Chancellor, what he said, Africa is the oldest continent and at the same time, the youngest continent in the world. To my mind, I think Africa is profoundly a man born, a man who refuses to grow even when he has been given all the vitamins that enhance his, his, his own growth. So could you please tell us and explain the paradox of Africa being the oldest continent and at the same time the youngest continent? Thank you. Commissioner, would you like to um, handle that first one, the man, boy, or woman, girl, whichever way you want to slice it? Please, Commissioner. Uh, first, on energy. Uh, uh, yes, very much so. Mini grid and off grid remain uh, solutions for uh, mainly rural areas and um, uh, and remote areas. And we are joining also forces with uh, with uh, various partners in order 
in order to um, make sure uh, that mini grids and off grids are deployed across the continent. We work also very closely with our economic arms, the, the African Development Bank, in that, in that area. But I would like to caution about something. And I keep repeating that. Our ambition in Africa is not to light a bulb and charge the mobile. Let that be. So, mini grids and off grids are temporary solutions. Our ambition is to industrialize and to develop and to compete globally. So we are also working on grids and power at to, uh, to cater for our ambitions and needs. So yes, for the, for the mini grids and off grids, and as I said, we are working on that, knowing that our ambition is beyond the mini grids and the off grids. Of course, it helps a lot also for the mini grids and the off grids, and which is helping in their uh, deployment, is that primarily or before, you know, investors were reluctant in doing that. They didn't know about the payment, how to do that, until, of course, Africa invented the mobile money. And we also pioneered projects like the COPA, I'm sure you know about that, which is also it's like a mini grid, solar, for which you pay in advance with your mobile money. So investors' problem was solved. So now we see more requests from private sector to work uh, and to deploy these uh, mini grids. Uh, on Africa being the oldest and the youngest, it's the oldest, I think, archaeologically, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not an expert in, in that, uh, but I have the number of billions of years for which we existed as a continent. Uh, so yes, we are the oldest. And I think somewhere in South Africa, there's a rock that is supposed to be the oldest in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, the name will come, will come to mind. Um, the youngest, look at us, look at the, the continent. More than 65% of the continent are young people. But not just young people in terms of age, the youngest with the youngest ideas. And that's the beautiful thing about the continent. It's not all uh, gloom and, and dark as, as, as people sometimes stereotype it to be. Uh, when the Vice-Chancellor shared with us some examples,